Welcome to The Quiet Curve of Hope, online worship with the community of St. James in Fergus, Ontario. On this 25th Sunday after Pentecost, this feast of the reign of Christ, we gather. Today we remember that we are citizens of God's kingdom, not Caesar's kingdom. We are followers of the servant king. Worship today is led by lay reader Dean Dunbar. Our preacher today is myself, Reverend Dan Turner. Some of us are still physically apart, but our hearts and our longings and our prayers bring us together as God's beloved. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We wish to acknowledge that we are land that at the time of contact was held by the Atawandran as an area of trade and ceremony by the two rivers. At various times, the land was occupied by both Haudenosaunee from the south and Anishinaabe from the north. In more recent times, the Huron Treaty gave rights to the Mississaugas of new credit. May we who dwell on or visit these lands and waterways also be good stewards and honor those who came before us. And may our actions be guided by our commitment to reconciliation. We come for God gathers us here with the community called Faith, where the hungry are served first, where the thirsty drink life's water. We come for Christ welcomes us here into the home called Grace, where the naked are clothed in robes of hope, where the stranger is embraced as a long lost prodigal. We come for the spirit reunites us here, sisters and brothers in that family called love, where the imprisoned model justice, where the sick are cradled in God's peace. Let us pray. Destitute King, one with the hungry, the naked, and the scorned, may our faith be proven not in dogma and piety, but in serving you in the last and the least. Through Jesus Christ, the stranger's Lord. Amen. Let us prepare ourselves for the word of God as it comes to us in the reading of Holy Scripture. Open our minds and our hearts, O God, as we listen to your word. Our psalm today is Psalm 95. Let us pray together responsibly. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. God be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen.
Jesus compares himself to a king who has moved among his subjects to see how he is treated, what is done for the least of those who belongs to his family is truly done for him. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, as told by Matthew, chapter 25, beginning at the 31st verse. The Judgment of the Nations. When the Son of Man comes into his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne at his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you were sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did to the one of the least of those, were my members of my family, you did to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are cursed, depart from me into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you were hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I will tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You are the living God. Jesus is your name, and all glory is yours. Let us join our voices in proclaiming this affirmation of faith. We believe in God, the maker and shaper of our pathways, who sent Jesus to show us our way, and who in the beginning and end of our journey, traveling. We believe in Jesus Christ, the sharer of our flesh, who entered and experienced the human journey, who walks beside us on the road. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the midwife and the nurturer of our potential, who drove Jesus out into the desert, and who calls us now to cast off from the shore. We believe in Father, Son, and Spirit, the shaper, sharer, and stirrer of our journeys and we recommit ourselves to follow their way. Hello, 
It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you today to unpack the Word of God as it comes to us in Holy Scripture. My prayer today is that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be faithful in God's sight, that only the truth be spoken here, and that only the truth be heard. All of this in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. In downtown Toronto, just outside of one of our theological colleges, rests a beautiful statue. It was unveiled in 2013 and is the work of Canadian sculptor Timothy Schmaltz. I wonder if any of you know the sculpture I'm referring to. I think some of you will recognize it when I tell you its name. It's called Homeless Jesus. The original sits outside of Regis College on the, the University of Toronto campus, and since its creation, casts have been installed all over the world. It's a poignant image of Jesus, huddled beneath a blanket, resting on a park bench, his face and hands obscured, and only the crucifixion wounds on his feet are there to reveal his identity. The artist is a faithful Roman Catholic, describes the sculpture as a visual translation of the text through which Jesus identifies himself, and he identifies himself with the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, even the prisoner. It's the text through which Jesus tells his followers, whatever you did to one of the least of these who are the members of my family, you did it to me. Well, not surprisingly, reactions to the statue vary. Some people find it offensive, others adore it. Pope Francis has blessed it, people sit and pray beside it, and as stories go, it's said that in one city, a woman even called the police within minutes of the sculpture's installation, assuming that the figure beneath the blanket was indeed a real homeless person. If you look on the front of your bulletins this week or remember the illustration that accompanied the gospel in the Quiet Curve resource, you'll see a picture of homeless Jesus as it appears on that U of T campus. This week, the church celebrates the reign of Christ or Christ the King, a kind of liturgical hinge between the long season after Pentecost. Yes, we have been observing this since June 7th, almost as long as the pandemic, I think, and the beginning of Advent. We pause this week to reflect on the meaning of Christ's reign over the church, the world, indeed, even our own lives. What kind of king is Jesus? What does his rule look and feel like? What does it mean to live and thrive under his kingship? Given the power and pageantry we typically associate with kings, we might expect the lectionary to give us readings that sound, well, more kingly. Something gorgeous from the book of Revelation, perhaps, about Jesus decked out in splendid robes and a jeweled crown. Or perhaps something majestic from Isaiah. A son will be given to us and the government will rest upon his shoulders. Or maybe at least a shiny moment from the Gospels. Jesus transfigured on the mountaintop. Or Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, or even Jesus emerging from the waters of baptism with the heavens thundering in his ears. But no, the royalty Jesus describes in Matthew's gospel is of another order entirely. It really is homeless Jesus, sick Jesus, imprisoned Jesus, hungry Jesus, naked Jesus. It is, in the words of theologian Fleming Rutledge, the royalty that stoops. The reign of Christ Sunday, despite its near eternal sense, is in fact a fairly recent addition to the Western liturgical calendar. It was instituted in 1925 by Pope Pius XI with the hope that a world ravaged by World War I might find in Jesus' humble kinship a needed alternative to empire and nationalism, to consumerism and secularism. What a beautiful vision. I think you'll agree, however, that it's not been realized. Perched here at the end of November in 2020, COVID-19 cases are soaring across our country and the world. 
not least because millions of people are refusing outright to wear masks and practice social distancing. What is that if not a refusal to see and tend to Jesus in our most vulnerable neighbors? Is not our sick king even now lying in thousands of hospital beds, struggling to breathe? Is not our king hungry, thirsty, naked after months of COVID-induced unemployment? Is Jesus not even now languishing in a million prison cells, feeling utterly expendable as the coronavirus rips through our jails and prisons? I fear that instead of embracing the countercultural possibility of a humble, wounded king, we have given ourselves over to a version of kingship that is all about domination and supremacy, about triumphalism and greatness. We have fallen in love with the loud, the muscular, the aggressive, all while forgetting that the only power Jesus wielded on earth was the power to give himself away. Jesus is the king who entered humanity, no doubt a red-faced and crying baby, a king whose greatest displays of power included momentous events like well, riding on a donkey or washing dirty feet or hanging on a cross, maybe frying fish on a beach for his friends. How did we go from this God of kenosis, the God who empties himself of all privilege, the God who perpetually pours himself out and surrenders his own life for his loved ones? That's a God of kenosis. How do we render that with this God as some kind of Iron Man? In our religious lives, our prayer lives, I think all of us long to see Jesus. We pray for an experience of Jesus' presence. We yearn to feel Jesus close to us. My goodness, we sing hymns, we recite creeds, we hear sermons, and some of us even attend Bible studies and spiritual formation programs all in the hopes of seeing and knowing Jesus in a deeper and more meaningful way. And of course, there is nothing wrong with any of these practices, unless they keep us at a comfortable arm's length from where Jesus actually is. Unless they lead us to believe that the work of justice and compassion is somehow secondary to the real business of Christianity. You see, the real business of Christianity is to follow the way of Jesus, to seek and serve Jesus here and now. And where is Jesus? Well, Jesus is in the least and the lost and the broken and the wounded. Jesus is in those unpretty places, in the bodies we refuse to discuss in polite company, in the faces we struggle to smile at, in the parts of town and the neighborhoods we speed through. It's not that we can earn our way to Jesus by caring for the vulnerable. It is that Jesus, by his own choice and volition, has stooped and surrendered in such a way that he is the vulnerable. There's no other way to get to Jesus, to know Jesus, but through engaging with those we have parked at the bottom of any list. Period. So what is it in us that still cannot help but turn away when Jesus offers us his whole self in such unbearable simplicity? And this is a real question, one I wrestle with all the time because I believe that each one of us, short of being a saint, remember what Dorothy Day said, don't call me a saint, has done just that, turned away. I have to ask myself, what am I afraid of? my inadequacy, my own vulnerability, my reputation. And even as I ask these questions, I cannot help but recall an uncomfortable definition that theologian James Keenan offers about mercy as the willingness to enter into the chaos of others. Hear that, mercy is the willingness to enter into the chaos of others. I wonder if that is what I am really afraid of. Maybe what we're all really afraid of. Other people's chaos. Let's sit with this for a minute. It really is okay to be afraid. 
It's okay to have questions. It's okay to see that huddled figure on a bench and not know exactly what to do. But at some point, our fears must come face to face with reality. Remember Jesus' words, whatever you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. At some point, we need to muster courage and risk. We need to act with a gospel heart. We need to serve. There's simply no way around it. Not if we take Jesus' kingship seriously. And there's another thing we need to take seriously from this gospel, and I'm going to bet it surprises you. There is no way around the perplexing fact that this reading that describes the final judgment of all humanity says absolutely nothing about belief. Let that sink in. Matthew 25 depicts a scene from the heavenly throne room, a scene describing the culmination of history when all the nations will gather before Christ and Christ will separate his people as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. My friends, notice the criteria we are told Jesus will use for that separation. Not our confession of faith, not our belief, not our doctrinal commitments, not even our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The criteria will be compassion, and compassion alone. Fleming Rutledge, who I quoted earlier, captures this measure of compassion in these words. The son who sits upon his glorious throne with all the nations gathered before him is the same one who, at the very apex of his cosmic power, reveals that the universe turns upon a cup of water given to the littlest ones in his name. If we are not at least a little bit unnerved, then I suggest we are not paying enough attention. Soon we will enter into Advent, a season of waiting and longing and listening. Soon we will walk into that expectant darkness waiting for the light to dawn, to remember the first cries of a baby, to redefine kingship, authority, and power forever. But on this Sunday, here and now, we're asked to see Jesus in places we would rather not look. We're asked to remember that every encounter we have with the least of these is an actual encounter with Jesus, This is not a metaphor. This is not wordplay. And my friends, I do not believe that this is optional. The person huddled beneath the blanket, that is our king. May we truly see him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let our hearts behold the silence of creation.
as our shared silence draws to a close. May our hearts remain open as we offer our lives and our loves before the Holy One in these prayers for the Kingdom. On this feast of the reign of Christ, let us turn our hearts to the compassionate reign of the servant King, God's beloved, our brother, Jesus Christ. Let us join our voices in passion and conviction. Pray for those who are hungry. Pray harder for those who will not feed them. Pray for those who struggle each week to pay their bills. Pray harder for the wealthy who do not care. Pray for those who are homeless. Pray harder for those who will deny them shelter. Pray for the sick and the lonely. Bless family and friends and caregivers as they worry and work for love. Pray harder for those who choose to withhold comfort and resources. Pray for those who cry out for dignity. Pray harder for those who will not listen. Pray for those oppressed by unjust wages. Pray harder for those who will exploit them. Pray for those who bear the yoke of prejudice. Pray harder for those who discriminate against them. Pray for those whose basic needs are denied. Pray harder for public officials who cater to the greedy and ignore those bound unjustly. Pray for those who grieve and those who find themselves alone. Today and in this community, remember all who are trying to make peace with the confinements and restrictions of these pandemic times. Lighten the burdens of those who struggle. Pray harder for those who turn their backs on their neighbors. Pray for this world, this community, this church. Bless us, gracious God, as we strive to follow the way of Jesus. Amen. As our Savior has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as our time of worship draws to a close, let me offer you this benediction. As you have been fed, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, Go to set free the imprisoned. As you have been received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And may God grant you a place of rest in these challenging times. May Christ Jesus be the servant king who binds your every wound. And may the Holy Spirit gift you with the wisdom to choose Jesus' way of compassion and peace. Amen. going forth, my sisters and brothers. Go be witnesses to the peace that Christ has promised us. Bring compassion and care to all God's children and open your hearts and hands 
to carry Christ's love and healing presence to the world. Amen. Alleluia.